Hello, this is Nick Augustine and I'm here with criminal defense attorney Bruce Isaacs here in Denton County and today we are about to talk about intoxication offenses, why no one should ever get a DWI anymore in 2019. That's right. That's right. We've got Uber, we have Lyft now. There is no reason why anybody should ever get a car and drive home after they've been drinking. But I don't see any decrease in the number of DWIs that we're getting. People are not taking advantage of Things that are easy to do and, quite frankly, are much cheaper to get charged with the DWI. Exactly. Plus, the uh, I saw someone driving the other day with one of those, the blower thing, mm -hmm. and especially if you're it's an ignition interlock device. Ignition interlock. Well, ignition interlock device. Yeah. All right. See, I've never had one. I would have good. Not going good. I don't ever want to have one. Um, because that would be awful. Because you can't look cool driving around with the ignition, ignition interlock device. No, we don't want that. All right, so let's say we are in a situation where we were just at a fundraiser. We had two glasses of wine, had a third maybe. You're, you're probably fine. You're at an event. You're not out partying at a bar. It depends but, how much you weigh. You know, it depends on how much you weigh. I mean, like, let's look at right now. Tonight we have the, the Denton County GOP Precinct Chair Appreciation Dinner. They're gonna have a wine. They're gonna have a wine bar there, you know. Yeah. And it's gonna be raining. Hopefully, people get pulled over the rain. But all you need, you know, it's hard to see. All you need to do is go over one of those white lines right. and fail to maintain your lane. Now you got Flower Mound PD or someone else, whoop, 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 Johnny Blue behind you. Um, what should people do? What do you do if you get stopped by an officer? If you get stopped for an officer, first thing you need to do is take action to put the officer at rest make him feel comfortable that you're not a threat to him before you even pull over. Uh -huh. uh, I always tell my clients if they get pulled over, pull over to the side of the road as quickly as they can in a safe location. Most cars have electric power windows now. I tell my clients, unroll all the windows so the officer can easily see inside the car and realize that you are not a threat to his safety. If it's at nighttime, you need to turn your overhead lights on so the officer can see what's doing in there. Don't start fumbling around looking for your driver's license and your insurance because that officer is going to be, he doesn't know whether you're going for your insurance in the glove box or whether you're going for a handgun in the glove box. You just sit there with your hands up on the wheel and wait for him to approach you. And if you have a gun license, you tell the, I always tell the officer I've got a concealed carry. You're required to. You're required to. I don't have my gun on me. A lot of times they're surprised that I say that. So I would think a cop might be also surprised that you're rolling all your windows down and letting your interior of your car up, you know, especially like what if it's raining or, it, you know. It doesn't matter. Your deal is you want to put that officer at ease. Right. If he's at ease, you have a lot better opportunity to have a, a productive uh, interaction with that officer right. as opposed to if he's concerned for his own safety. I asked you, why did you put your windows down? Well, I saw Bruce Isaac's video and he said, you know, make the officer feel at ease and put the windows right. down. So, so, he, so he can see inside. Right, exactly. So um, the other thing you need to do when you get pulled over is always be polite, be respectful, be courteous to that police officer. Because if you get charged with DWI or if you get charged with any kind of crime, the assistant district attorney, they're going to watch that video on that stop. And if you're being a problem to that officer, if you're being discourteous, if you're being disrespectful, you're not going to get treated well by the DA's office. People that get the better deals are people that have good attorneys and they're people that were polite and courteous during the interaction. Right. If you have to have a jury trial, you don't want that jury seeing you being a complete fool with that officer. Right. Even if you're nervous, I mean, it's okay to be nervous. Everybody's nervous when they pull and they know that's that. okay. Yeah. Right. Exactly. They know that and the jury doesn't. Right. But to sort of assume that everything is going to be, you know... Everything is going to be reviewed. And there's cameras on everything now. Yes, there are. And the police cars have cameras and almost all the officers have body cameras. Right. If they don't have a body camera, they at least are wearing a wireless microphone and the in-car video and police cars recording your conversation. It used to, it only was the uh, the police car itself had the right. thing because they used to make people stand in front of the police car right. to do their field they, sobriety They still do that uh, lots of times for field sobriety testing, yes. Mm -hmm. Did they still, I, I remember when you would get pulled over that they used to bring you into the car and you'd walk around the passenger door and they say, see, I got you going a little fast on my little dial here. Yeah. Like, they, they don't do that so much anymore and you know, another thing has changed. So you shouldn't just get out of your car. Wait for them to tell you to get out of the car. Okay. The officer does not want you to get out of the car and start walking back to them while you're still sitting in the car. Yeah, no Because that makes him a target. Right, right. You stay in the car until the officer tells you to get out of the car. So, my next question then, with um, if they think that, you know, have you been drinking and, you know, don't lie, 
or you know, if you say I've had, a, you know, one or two or whatever you say, you know, it's gonna we're gonna come up to breath tests and field sobriety tests. And what, the point of doing a lot of these videos is to kind of kill some of the word on the street that people have of do this, don't do that. I mean, don't get legal advice from the guy, your cousin who beat their rap in some other county down in Houston or something like that. Um, so, uh, field sobriety tests and breath tests, what should you do? What are your options? You don't ever have to do a field sobriety test. Uh, you don't have to agree to do a breath test. Mm -hmm. I always tell people that ask me that question is if you are 100% certain that you know how many drinks you've had and you're going to be under the limit, it's okay to take that test. But most people have no idea whether they have had three drinks, five drinks, or seven drinks. Well, and what size the, I mean, so I had a beer. What well, was a beer like this? Is a beer like this? Well, it's not just what size the beer is, it's what brand the beer is. Right. Because beer doesn't all have the same alcohol concentration. Right, exactly. When we do an interview for a prospect of client, in that case, I always ask them, what brand of beer are you drinking? Is it light? Is it, you know, is it step? What is it? Mm -hmm. Because each one of those has a different alcohol content. So, what then, so whether you decide to do the test or not, what's, what are you looking at either way? If you refuse to do a breath test or if you refuse to do a blood test, your driver's license is going to be suspended. But sometimes it's better to have a suspension on your driver's license than to give the district attorney hard, solid evidence in the result of a breath test or a blood test that they can use against you at your trial. Are there any situations where your refusal may be negated by they're saying we're doing a blood draw anyways? And I'm thinking of these, uh, the no refusal weekends. Try to answer my question there. The, the, uh, well, the, the field sobriety tests, in my opinion, are designed to fail. You know, they have you take and do things that are unnatural. Right. One of the things they have you do is called the walk and turn. In the walk and turn, they have you, people usually stand with their feet, you know, shoulder width. That's normal, that's natural. For the walk and turn, they have you stand with your feet, one right in front of the other, touching each other, and that makes it very difficult to balance. Sure. Uh, when you do the walk and turn, you don't get to use your arms for balance. You don't ever see a tightrope walker walk across a tightrope without using his arm for balance. You know, it's a, great, it's a good point you made. I had a, a vertigo issue several months ago. I'm just now able to, because I would test yeah. myself in my own kitchen. You know, like, I haven't had a drink in weeks, and would I be able to even pass the test right now? And I don't know if I even could. And anyone that has a background, I mean, there's some real legitimate, I've seen people pull over and say, no, my leg hurts, my this hurts. So they're designed yeah. to fail you. I, I think those tests are designed That's to fail. Opinion. And yeah. they're, those tests, some of them have some level of accuracy, but they have to be done exactly accurate and correctly by the officers. Most of the times when I review videotapes and field sobriety testing on the side of the road, they're not being done correctly. Mm -hmm. they're, they're being done too quickly, uh, like the horizontal gauge of stagnus. Out of, out of those three field sobriety tests are standardized, that one has the most potential to be accurate, but it's got to be done exactly as planned and designed. All right. But if the cops want your blood, can they force you? Can they force a blood? They can get a search warrant. They can get, they have uh, to get a search warrant. They have to get a search warrant. Again, I wouldn't consent to it unless I was absolutely positive I'd had less than three drinks. Right. If you consent to a blood draw, then your lawyer doesn't have the opportunity to try to claim that the valid, the search warrant is, is vague mm -hmm. or avoidable or invalid. If you can sit, that issue of defense is gone. Right. So there's really not much you can do if they get a warrant for your blood. If they get a warrant for your blood, you're going to have to cooperate right. and give it to them. Cooperate, you know, so you're not consenting by letting them do it. No. Nope. You don't have to karate chop the nurse. You don't want to do that because you're going to get charged with assault. You're going to add, yeah. you, know, you don't want to add you're more charges. Out, yeah. Just be like, no, I don't consent, take the blood. Exactly. Right. And let Bruce deal with it. Right. All right. Bruce, when we're concerned with intoxication charges and what to do if someone is charged, multiple offenses is a really important deal. And there's a lot of people who may be new to Texas who don't understand yeah. how multiple DWIs can impact you where the law might have been different in other states and how far they go back. So what should we know about that? But the laws are different in every state. Right. Driving law intoxicated is one of those kind of charges that if you get placed on probation for it, 
or if you go to jail for driving while intoxicated, if you ever, ever, doesn't matter whether it's five years from now, 10 years from now, 25 years from now, if you ever get arrested again and charged with driving while intoxicated, they can use that first class B misdemeanor to enhance the punishment for the second one. If you get two misdemeanors, if you ever get charged with a third one, again, it doesn't matter whether it's 50 years later, that can be a felony. They'll use the B misdemeanor DWI, they'll stack the A misdemeanor DWI on there and turn that into a third degree felony. You're talking about going to prison anywhere from two years to 10 years. That's no fun. We used to have a law in Texas called the 10 year relation back rule. Uh -huh. And it said that if there had been more than 10 years between the last DWI and this DWI, that they couldn't use to enhance it. That is not the law in Texas now. Okay. Now it doesn't matter how old that commission is. So, and that's a so third degree felony. So for people who don't get a lot of felonies, what are the degrees and how bad is a third degree? Uh, well, we have, uh, basically we have five different kinds of felonies in Texas. We have capital felonies, we have first degree felonies, second degree, third degree, and then we have something called a state jail felony in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. Third degree felony is going to be the second from the lowest, but it's still two to ten years in prison. Right, and also the felony conviction means no voting, no firearms, right. no a lot of things. Exactly. No a lot of things. You'll probably have to go start your own business because no one's going to hire you. Right. That's a problem. You're going to um, have trouble renting an apartment. Yeah. They don't want convicted felons in apartment complex. Good luck if good luck if you get divorced and need to remarry or date again. Yeah. People are like, I'm not touching you, you're right. a felon. It's a really bad thing. And I was a friend of mine who was telling you, she was in a women's prison, and she does a lot of help to rehabilitating people. And it's 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 amazing the challenges that they face, and they can't get, they just can't do anything. The, uh, on, on these on these multiple drive-wall intoxicated charges, Nick, I have a client right now who's actually been to prison for drive-wall intoxicated. That was a felony. Now he has a new DWI. So that is a second degree felony. He's looking at two to 20 years in prison because he's already been to prison once for DWI. We actually have a guy serving time in a Texas prison who got a life sentence out of the Denton County jury for DWIs because he had like a burglary he got in prison for, he had a, like a felony theft he went to prison for, mm -hmm. and then he picked up a felony DWI. That is treated under the habitual criminal statute. That is 25 years to life. That's a really, it's... It's serious. It's, I mean, you can't, I, I don't even know. I wouldn't even, can't even imagine being in that spot. We, we have these high penalties for DWIs because driving while intoxicated, it endangers and jeopardizes, you know, the motoring public. It does. But what happens is people will get arrested for, say, a first DWI. They go, well, I'm not gonna spend the money to go hire a good lawyer because I'm just gonna get misdemeanor probation for the DWI. Maybe you are. But you need to see if you can get found not guilty of that DWI so you don't get enhanced later. I'm trying to remember what the case was maybe 20 years, 30 years ago, where someone had, the guy, I think he was in Houston, and um, until bad stuff happens in Houston, it doesn't happen here. <laughs> but, um, so it was something where he had, I don't know, 10, 15, hmm. and he, he wasn't even in jail. And Mothers Against Drunk Driving, as a group, they got their butts in the seats and did a lot of work to change the laws and lobby. And so people who may think that they know what the law is because something happened years ago right. don't know that things have changed. Another thing is with out of state. So let's say someone comes here from California and they had um, you know, something that they had some priors there. How does that affect them here in Texas? That's a good question, Nick. I have clients tell me all the time that are being treated as a visual criminal, well, they can't use that. That happened in a different state. They can use that to enhance it. If, if the, it doesn't have to have the same name, but if it has similar type elements in the offense, they certainly can use an out state conviction to enhance somebody. Mm -hmm. I had a guy today that I represented. He's been to prison out of Mississippi twice. First thing he told me when he saw the indictment is they can't use those paragraphs. That's another state. They can use them, and they did in that case. That guy was looking at 25 life. Right. So it's so don't think that just because those are and the one you know the one may be a what's a conviction or what was the deferred prosecution things you can't just think oh well that's not gonna matter it, it, it will matter even though it ex just by its very existence itself and they can find everything now as going to be used against you so that's not something that people should hide from their criminal defense attorney exactly right exactly right. All right. It's better for the lawyer to hear it from the client than hear it from the prosecutor. Here's a good one. 
How have you seen anyone change their ways after um, intoxication events? And we t we think about you know, these people who are sort of like, you know, at what point do you stop? Like you realize, like you got a drinking problem, man. If you have multiple right. DWIs, you're spending all this money on lawyers. You don't think that's a problem? I think that's a problem. Anytime I have a client who has like a felony DWI, I tried to guide them into some type of rehabilitation program. Uh -huh. At the very least, they need to be involved with AA. I mean, I tell my guys to go three to five times a week. Mm -hmm. Go there, document that you're there for a couple of reasons. Number one, it will help them not drink right. so they don't get in trouble again. And number two, if I can take and show the prosecutors that my client has gone to 127 AA meeting since he got arrested last year, they're going to take a different look at that guy as somebody who's trying to change, and I'm going to get a lot better outcome for that person. Uh, to answer your question more specifically, sometimes I have clients be charged with a new guy, and they never, ever drive again after they've had a drink. I have clients, they just don't, they just don't learn. Mm -hmm. They do it again and again and again. And those are the kind of guys that you know, get these really big sentences, like that guy that got a life sentence for DWI and didn't. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's no, you're, you've got a, you have a jury, and the jury is not going to be sympathetic when, no, they're not. you know, it's, they, it, it's hard to pick, it's hard to get a jury in the jury box without somebody in there having a family member who's been killed, or a family member who's been injured, or a close friend who's had somebody injured by a DWI defendant. Well, it is very difficult to get a jury that doesn't have some kind of bias against DWI. Well, and they're, they're wondering, why didn't you take an Uber? Why didn't you call right. a friend? I mean, this is Denton County in 2019. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, not long ago, we didn't have Ubers. I right. live in Shady Shores, and I can get an Uber. Right. We can get Ubers all over the place. There's no excuse now. I, I live out in the country, 20 miles out of town, and Uber will come pick me up or take me home. Really? Home. They sure will. Wow. And it may cost a little bit, but... It's going to be much cheaper than having to hire me or any good quality attorney. I shouldn't ask what, uh, <laughs> what a the DWI defense costs these days. Well, it costs a lot of money. It's not just having to hire the lawyer. There are, you know, fines. Mm -hmm. uh, your car insurance rates are going to go through the roof if you get picked up and convicted on DWI. I mean, there's all kinds of expenses. At one time, we had surcharges. Now we don't have surcharges, but we now have something that's called a super fine. Mm -hmm. And that's a fine that is in addition to the five that sit forth in the penal code already. I saw it go. I saw those where those went up, and it was they're substantial. Yeah, a a first time DWI defendant, the fine can be anywhere from one dollar to two thousand dollars. The second time is anywhere from one dollar to four thousand dollars. When you get a felony DWI, just the fine can be up to ten thousand dollars. Let's talk about then you pay the super fine. There's, you know what I didn't think about. Um, so when we're talking about intoxication offenses, we're not only talking about I had too many beers. Right. We're talking about marijuana. You know, hey, I smoked weed earlier in the day. Right. You know, you can. I've seen on live TV though, Williamson County, Texas. They pull them over. You know, do your thing, do your tests, and I mean, there's all. They're going right. to have sens the sensors. Thank Here's you. the deal, Nick, that people don't seem to realize: uh -huh. if you're taking prescription medication, that too. And if you're taking it correctly in the dosage level you're supposed to, if it affects your ability to drive a car safely, you can be convicted for driving while intoxicated for taking the medications your doctor has prescribed. But a lot of people don't realize that. And lots of medicine, if you're taking medicine and you can normally have two beers and it doesn't really impair you, if it interacts with your medication, it's called a synergistic effect. It's, it's like a multiplier effect. You may not be able to drink anything while you take that medicine. Right, so taking pills is not an excuse. Even if it's legal, right. legal medicine. It's not an excuse, you can be convicted. There are lots of people that have no idea that's the law. All right, so intoxication can involve prescription pills. Not prescription not pills. Not prescription pills. Uh, recreational drugs right. of all different and sorts. Booze. Synthetic things that right. nobody even knows what they are, you know. You're sniffing paint thinner glue. Oh, yeah. Who knows? And I've had cases, I've had all those situations. You know, I've had people that were, you know, like puffing, you know, aerosol paint. Air conditioners. Yeah. They do that. The air right. conditioners not. Right. My friend's air conditioner got attacked by some junkie who was yep. like getting high off the air conditioner. Yep. Don't drive after <laughs> doing that. That's exactly right. But if you do, <laughs> if you give a call, yeah. give Bruce yeah. Isaacs a call. So right. there's they're really complex issues here. They are. There's a lot that people don't realize and you should not dabble in criminal defense when 
your I mean your livelihood is on the line. Right. Having that felony for multiple it's just so it's that's a life game changer. Oh, yeah, so yeah. you know, it's you know, go talk to grandma, you know. Yeah, go talk to your grandma. Get to the loan out of your home, whatever you need to do. Right, exactly, because you'll you'll be happy that you'll be able to you'll be free to work that off. Right. What do they get paid in jail these days? And like fifty cents a day or something? Yeah, it's, it's not going to pay for it's, your yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not enough money. So, yeah. all right. Well, thank you all for listening to this uh, and watching this video podcast. As you may have found it, please do share these with your friends in your networks because we just never know whose kid just got uh, stopped for uh, driving after having too many drinks. It's important stuff, and you don't want to mess up. You want to get this stuff done right, and only do it once and get it done right the first time. That's right, Nick. Call Bruce Isaacs.